Hi, my name is Regina, and in the following, I will show you the results of my thesis with the title Monitoring Velocity Changes in Iceland with Fiber Optic Distributed Acoustic Sensing. At first, I would like to introduce you to the study area. So here in the top right, you see a sketch of Iceland. The plate sp spreading of the American and the Eurasian plate is indicated, and the red box denotes the location of the Reykjanes Peninsula, which is our study area and shown here in the big figure in detail. The yellow line marks a volcanic zone, which is associated with a lot of eruptive fissures and normal faults here given by the black and red lines. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to the purple areas, which show high temperature geothermal fields, and the red dots show geothermal power plants. The black thick line represents the bare scale used in the study. It starts in the town of Grindavik, then goes up to the Svartsengi power plant, where it bends towards the southwest. Here, I show the time period March between mid-August of 2020. The blue dots show the vertical component of a GPS instrument. We see that between March and April, such as between mid-May and mid-June, an uplift of the crust, also called inflation, was measured. So these time periods are marked in gray. Each inflation period is followed by deflation or subsidence of the crust and associated with an increased seismicity. This is demonstrated in the upper figure where we see earthquakes as a function of time and magnitude and the black line denotes the cumulative number. The center of deformation coincides with the geothermal area at the Svartsengi geothermal power plant. So here we were wondering whether we can identify changes in seismic wave velocities caused by the deformation. But what do we gain if we measure changes in seismic wave velocities? Well, we gain insights into dynamic processes in the Earth. By measuring velocity changes, we can detect structural and dynamic variations that are caused by environmental processes, such as earthquakes and volcanoes. And thus, we can infer the response of Earth structure to these processes. This can be used for a broad range of topics, such as groundwater monitoring, natural hazard assessment, and monitoring of magmatic and deformation processes. The data we use are recorded by DAS, or Distributed Acoustic Sensing. And here I show the main measurement principle of DAS. The black box denotes the interrogator, that's an electronic device, which sends a light pulse into an optical fiber, here represented by the gray line. And while most of the light will just propagate through the entire fiber, a small portion of it will be backscattered at local heterogeneities. This is demonstrated here by the blue box, which shows a fiber segment containing lots of impurities, and it's exactly there where the light is backscattered and sent back to the interrogator. The interrogator measures the phase of the backscattered light. And if the cable is now disturbed by an external field, then the position of these impurities changes a little bit, and this is then reflected in a phase change of the backscattered light. And it's this phase change that the interrogator uses and transforms into a value of strain rate along the axial direction of the fiber. So that's really important that we only have one component. We can only measure in the direction of the fiber. So what we obtain in the end is a time series that looks pretty much like a conventional seismometer trace, just that the unit is different. We don't have velocity or displacement, but strain rate. The main advantage of this is that it has an extremely dense spatial resolution. So for example, here, that's the geom geometry of our cable, and we have a spatial sampling of four meters, which means that we can take measurements every four meters along the entire cable. With a total length of 21 kilometers, we can thus analyze more than 5,000 channels. In order to infer velocity variations, we analyze the emit seismic noise. So this time series here is clearly dominated by the earthquake signal at the beginning. And the earthquake occurs at a very specific point in time. However, it also shows continuously recorded faint background oscillations, and it's exactly that what we call the ambient seismic noise. So I emphasize here that the main advantage when analyzing ambient seismic noises is that it is continuously recorded such that measurements at any point in time are feasible. There are different generation mechanisms of the ambient seismic noise. We will focus on frequencies below one hertz that are typically generated by the interaction between the atmosphere, ocean gravity waves, and the solid Earth. 
But how are we going to extract any information of the ambient seismic noise, which looks rather incoherent and random? And this brings me to the concept of ambient noise interferometry. So here in the top, we see two stations, A and B, that record ambient seismic noise. The main principle of ambient noise interferometry is that if we cross-correlate these ambient noise traces, then we obtain an approximation of the Green's function between these two stations. An example of how this can look like is in the bottom figure. Here we see a time symmetric response with positive lag times corresponding to the causal side and negative lag times corresponding to the A causal side of the cross-correlation. In the interest of time, I won't explain in depth why this works, but it is important to remember that the causal side can be interpreted as the seismogram that we would record if station A was a source and B a receiver. And equivalently, the A causal side reflects the seismogram recorded if station B was the source and A the receiver. So the main takeaways here are cross collation of MN seismic noise turns one station into a virtual source yields the Green's function between the stations of which we can treat the causal and a-causal sites as conventional seismograms. So now we know that in order to infer velocity variations over time, we will analyze cross correlations of ambient seismic noise recorded by DAS. But how are we actually going to measure velocity changes? And the answer to that is Kohler wave interferometry. Here we see lots of scatterers represented by the black dots in a homogeneous medium, which I call reference medium. The red star denotes a seismic source that emits waves that are recorded by a station at the surface. The blue line shows the direct wave, which follows a very simple trajectory and is recorded at early times in the seismogram. The black line, however, is bounced back and forth at the scatterers and spends much more time in the medium than the direct wave. Consequently, it is recorded at late times in the seismogram and the so-called coda. Here, a small portion of the medium has changed such that the waves that travel through it are faster than before. So here the red dashed line shows the time series recorded in the altered medium and the black line, again, the time series recorded in the reference medium. In the case of the direct wave, almost no difference between the waveforms is visible. And this is because the direct wave just goes straight from the source to the receiver and does not really spend a lot of time in the altered zone. The coda wave, however, because it is frequently scattered, spends much more time in the modified zone. And as a consequence, it arrives much earlier compared to the reference medium. So here we would say that the altered waveform is compressed. And similarly, if the medium was slower, the coda wave um, would arrive later than in the reference medium and the waveform would be stretched. So coda waves are very sensitive to alterations of the medium, and we can use that to measure changes in the travel time of coda waves in altered media with respect to a reference medium. So the main workflow towards measuring velocity changes is as follows. As first, at first, we apply a mean noise interferometry in order to extract the wave field between two points in space. Then we apply coda wave interferometry in order to measure changes of the wave field over time. Lastly, we can finally identify the velocity change in order to detect dynamic processes in the crust. So let me point out why the combination DAS and coda wave interferometry is so exciting. Typically, when only seismometers are available, we can obtain few cross correlations for stations that are far away from each other. So for here, for example, in our study region, the seismometers are represented by the triangles here, and we could cross correlate the ambient seismic noise recorded at these two stations or also at these two stations. However, the velocity changes can then only be attributed to very large areas, and the response of crustal rocks at small spatial scales cannot be resolved. DES, however, has an extremely dense spatial sampling so that we can obtain many cross correlations between different stations that are close to each other as indicated here. And in this talk, we will see how the spatial resolution can be exploited to infer dynamic processes in the Earth's crust at small spatial scales. So to summarize this introduction, our goal is to infer the variations of seismic velocities over time between March and mid-August of 2020, where repeated uplift and subsidence of the crust was measured. We will analyze the ambient seismic noise recorded by DES and apply ambient noise interferometry and coda wave interferometry. 
The main two questions that motivate our study are, can we relate the velocity relations to the measured deformation? And can we exploit the spatial resolution of DAS to improve our measurements? So let's finally look at some data. Here, we see a time series and the corresponding spectrogram for a channel whose position on the fiber is indicated here in the map. The spectrogram shows the frequency content of this channel over time and 24 hours are shown. We want to analyze frequencies below one hertz and we see that the main energy, um, yeah, the most energetic frequencies are those between 0.1 and 0.4 hertz, continually, continuously recording energy here. However, and I won't go into detail here, we found that we can't use the, these frequencies. This is mainly because the noise in this frequency range is two directional, emphasized by the fact that our stations are very close to the Atlantic Ocean, which provides really strong noise sources and some assumptions that must hold for emit noise interferometry are violated. So this is why we had to go to slightly higher frequencies and we found that the frequency range 0.5 to 0.8 Hertz yields reliable results. So let's start in our workflow and apply emit noise interferometry in order to extract the wave field between points in space. For this, we could, for example, choose two channels on the fiber. So here, the red star denotes the position of the virtual source and the yellow triangle is the receiver. And if we cross correlate the corresponding time series, then we obtain the Green's function between these two stations. But let's exploit the full resolution of DAS and cross correlate the virtual source with multiple receivers at the same time. So this is demonstrated here in the upper left figure. Again, the virtual source is indicated and the receivers are evenly distributed along the whole fiber. The cross correlations can now be displayed in a so-called correlation gather shown here. On the x-axis, we see distance along fiber in kilometers and on the y-axis, the time lag in seconds is shown. Emanated by the virtual source, coherent surface waves travel along the fiber. The first six kilometers here shown in blue correspond to the fiber section that is more north-south oriented here. And the last 15 kilometers shown in, um, demonstrated in, in green correspond to the northeast southwest trending part. Clearly, the signal quality is much poorer on the north-south trending part. And this, the reason for this is the sensitivity of the fiber. So we remember that the channels measure only in the direction of the fiber. We only have one component. And because of that, the channels on the north-south oriented part are less sensitive to the waves that are emanated by the virtual source. And the signal quality is pretty poor. The channels on the green part, however, are roughly in line with the virtual source. And because of that, they are sensitive to the waves emanated by the virtual source. And we obtain a good signal quality. So the quality of the cross correlations depends on the angle between the source and the receiver. Let's briefly repeat the study goal. We want to infer velocity variations over time between March and mid-August of 2020. However, because of memory issues, data for all channels could not be provided for the entire time period. And this is why we had to select a reduced data set. To do so, we look again at our cross correlations and we remember that the correlation quality is high for receivers that are in line with the virtual source. And this is why we select two cable sections that are roughly in line and located on the Northeast Southwest trending part of the fiber. With these channels, we again apply ambient noise interferometry and extract the Green's functions through cross correlation. We do that for each combination of stations and each day of the analysis. Thus, we obtain 164 daily cross correlations for each station combination. This is shown here for an arbitrary channel combination. So here, daily cross correlations as a function of time are shown and 164 cross correlations are plotted next to each other. Now we can move on and apply coda wave interferometry to measure changes of the wave field over time. This processing step mainly aims at increasing the signal to noise ratio of the cross correlations in order to be able to define the reference medium and the altered media that will be compared. So remember that we will measure differences in the arrival time and the altered traces with respect to the reference trace. So let's start with the definition of the reference trace. This needs to be really robust and reliable 
since we will measure deviations from it. And we achieve that by stacking over the entire time period. So here, the reference trace is made up of all these 164 cross correlations stacked. And during the stacking process, incoherent noise interferes destructively, which is why we obtain a really good signal to noise ratio on the reference trace. Reference traces are computed for each station combination. A good signal quality is also required for the altered traces. And also here we make use of temporal stacking and stack a certain number of daily cross correlations in time. However, we can imagine that by stacking in time, we lose temporal resolution. And the main trade-off here is to obtain the maximum time resolution possible by keeping the signature noise ratio of the traces high enough such that reliable measurements can be obtained. For example, we could stack lots of days or daily cross correlations um, and would then obtain a very low time resolution but a high signal to noise ratio. In contrast, if we stack few days, then we obtain a high time resolution but may have a very low signal to noise ratio. So in order to constrain or to define the optimal temporal stack length, we look at two parameters. The first is the signal to noise ratio measured on the coda for an increasing stack length in days. And the second is the waveform coherence, so the correlation coefficient between the stack traces and the reference trace. Here you can already keep in mind that the similarity between the stack traces and the reference trace is an important quality factor in our analysis. Typically, the optimal temporal stack length is chosen where the waveform coherence function converges. However, we choose to stack 10 days, although the convergence of the waveform coherence is not yet, not yet um, reached. And we will explain later why we do this. So each measuring point later will be based on a stack, including 10 daily cross correlations that are compared to the reference trace. As we, as we have identified the reference medium and the alter traces, um, we can finally identify the velocity changes in order to detect dynamic variations in the crust. To do so, we use the so-called stretching method. This method uses the fact that a waveform is compressed if the medium velocity is faster and stretched if the velocity is slower relative to a reference medium. So the stretching method aims to find the best fitting stretching. And in practice, we stretch the waveforms for a different range of stretching values. This is illustrated here, where we see lapse time in seconds on the x-axis and on the y-axis, different stretching values, epsilon, where epsilon greater zero implies compression and epsilon smaller zero stretching of the waveform. The orange lines mark the altered traces for the given, given stretching values and the black lines, the reference trace. For each stretching value, we now compute the correlation coefficient between the reference trace and the alter trace, as shown here. The true velocity change then corresponds to the stretching value with the highest correlation coefficient. So here, for example, we will choose a stretching value of minus 1.5, since here we obtain the best similarity between the alter trace and the reference trace. With this knowledge, we can finally look at the results. They will be shown in the figure on the right. On the x-axis, x -axis, the entire time period is shown, and on the y-axis, the results for different station combinations will be shown separately. In the upper plot, velocity variations will be displayed. In the lower plot, the cor corresponding correlation coefficients between the optimally stretched waveform and the reference trace. And the relative velocity change is typically considered as reliable if, this, if the corresponding correlation coefficient is greater than 0.7. We first have a look at the relative velocity changes for the channel pair whose channels are located at the eastern ends of the channel sections. The channel in section one acts as virtual source and the channel in section two as receiver. The results are now shown at the bottom of the right figure. Blue colors indicate slow and red colors high relative wave speeds here in the velocity variation plot. Now we move a bit on the cable towards the west and take the next combination of channels. We can continue by always keeping the interstation distance constant until we cover the entire sections. Now we can define the mean by averaging over all station pairs shown by the black line in the top of the figure and the two inflation periods taking place in Reykjanes 
are indicated. So as we are analyzing more or less the same area, we would expect a high match between the results for different station combinations. However, although a certain spatial coherency seems to be present, the velocity changes look rather randomly distributed, and also the correlation coefficients are pretty poor, which indicates that the measurements are not reliable. So at this point, we were wondering whether we could better exploit the spatial resolution of DAS to improve our results. To further motivate this, we consider four DAS traces positioned at 0, 4, 8, and 800 meters on the fiber. And we see that the adjacent traces basically record the same waveform, while the phases at 800 meters clearly deviate. And what we did is we estimated the wavelengths and our cross correlations and found that they are roughly three kilometers, which means that, that they are much larger than the channel spacing of four meters. And adjacent traces, yeah, actually record the same waveform or contain the same information. We can use this abundancy of information to stack the data in space. I emphasize here that spatial stacking refers to the simple linear stacking of traces without applying any time shifts. We expect a wavelength dependency, and in order to answer the question what percentage of the wavelength we can spatially stack, we carried out a synthetic study whose details I cannot present in the interest of time, but we found that we can stack roughly 7% of the initial wavelength, which would imply in our setting that we can spatially stack up to a distance of 200 meters. So with the same traces, we repeat the analysis and retrieve Green's functions between different channel combinations. But before doing so, we spatially stack the raw data up to 7% of the wavelength or 200 meters in space. So how does spatial stacking affect the results? Let's go back to the definition of the altered traces. We see again the evolution of the waveform coherence and the signal to noise ratio where the cross correlation is shown before. And these are the results for an increasing spatial stack length. Clearly, the convergence of the correlation coefficients is faster and reached after approximately 10 days for greater stack lengths, accompanied by overall higher signal to noise ratios. And this applies that if we stack the data in space prior to the correlation procedure, we gain time resolution. And this is one of the most important results of our studies since dynamic changes in the crust may be identified that were previously not detectable. Here I show again the inferred velocity changes in the case where no spatial stacking was applied. Now let's look what happens if spatial stacking was applied over an area that corresponds to roughly 3% of the dominant wavelength. So this result looks already much better. The correlation coefficients are much higher than in the previous figure, and also the velocity variations look smoother and show a better spatial coherency. For stack length of 6.6% of the wavelength, the result is further improved. The correlation coefficients are overall pretty high, except for a few cases, which indicates that the found velocity variations are reliable. Overall, we detect velocity changes with magnitudes up to 1%. And we can identify several trends in the data. At the end of March and at the beginning of the second inflation period, a velocity drop occurs seen by all channel pairs. Interestingly, an inclined branch with high relative velocities emerges first in the east in April and approximately one month later in the west. So remember that the velocity changes shown in the bottom correspond to channel pairs in the east of the sections and the results in the top to channel pairs in the west. So this branch seems to migrate from the northeast to the southwest. And these observations suggest that we can indeed observe how different parts of the crust responds to dynamic changes. Thus, we can analyze the velocity variations and resolve the velocity variations in time and space. So let's interpret these results. Overall, the velocities seem to be relatively higher during deflation periods, so during subsidence of the crust. I will not go into detail here, but overall there seems to be no evident correlation between the seismicity and the velocity variations. Very interesting in our results is the fact that structural changes seem to be first detected in the Northeast and lastly in the Southwest of the fiber. A different study 
suggests a model for the processes occurring at depth during the inflation periods. And according to this model, volcanic gas intrudes into a horizontally sealed aquifer during each inflation period at intrusion rates of 8.1 and 5.8 cubic meters per second during the first and second inflation period. Uh, this is illustrated in the upper left figure. The volcanic gas migrates along the brittle ductile boundary, which domes up beneath the point where the maximum uplift was measured. Here it intrudes into an aquifer at approximately four kilometers step, creates a strong pressure, which finally induces the uplift between the points A and B. In the lower figure, we see the orientation of the profile A and B in space relative to our DAS table. The aquifer, shown in blue, is located beneath the eastern channel section that we chose for our analysis. The red crosses mark the location where the maximum uplift occurred. And here it becomes clear that the volcanic gas intrudes from the northeast to the southwest into the aquifer. The rate at which our velocity changes, let's say, propagate is roughly 0.5 millimeters per second. And in order to roughly estimate whether the pattern in our results could be related at all to the intruding fluids, we approximate the intrusion band or the, the aquifer as a cylinder with radius r. So during the first inflation period, 8.1 cubic meters intrude into the aquifer in one second. And if we assume a fluid propagation velocity of 0.5 millimeters per second, we can calculate the radius of the vent. For the first inflation period, we obtain a radius of 80 meters. And although this is more than three times larger than the suggested radius of 15 to 25 meters, it is very interesting that the values have the same order of magnitude. However, how the intrusion of the gas exactly relates to the patterns that we find in our results is still unclear. There are several aspects that complicate the interpretation. One point is that the study area is pretty heterogeneous. For example, it is not clear how the high temperature geothermal field at the Svartsenge geothermal plant influences the measurements since it covers a large part of the fiber. In addition, more than 2000 earthquakes during the entire time period occur. And yeah, this causes that the ground is constantly stressed, which makes it really difficult to isolate the individual processes that induce the velocity changes. However, a link to the intrusion of the gas does not seem unlikely, as we have seen on the previous slides. I would like to conclude my talk by answering the questions that I posed at the beginning. So can we relate the velocity variations to the measured deformation? We have seen that this is complicated, but the velocity changes may be associated with the intrusion of volcanic gas into an aquifer beneath the cable. More research is necessary to address this question. The second question was, can we exploit the spatial resolution of DAS to improve our measurements? And here the answer is clearly yes. DAS has the potential to monitor velocity changes in time and space. Thus, we can infer dynamic processes in the crust at small spatial scales. This is emphasized by spatial stacking, which also increases the time resolution of the measurements, which makes them more sensitive to short-term environmental processes. Thank you very much for listening.